Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for tuning into my uh, talk. I'm really excited to be here. As Pedro mentioned, I will be talking about using NLP to improve the management of clinical data. And as you might have guessed um, from the name of the organization I work with, I'll be talking a lot about metadata management throughout the talk. So um, I hope you are uh, find it interesting. <laughs> I'll get started. Uh, Pedro gave me a pretty good introduction. I'm Courtney. Uh, I am Data Operations Lead at Metadata Works. I'm a fairly new data scientist. Uh, until a couple of years ago, I had a career in international development and I um, have recently retrained and started working in, in data science. Um, I've put my Twitter handle here. I don't actually tweet an awful lot, but if you follow me, I'll follow you and I'd, I'd like to remain part of the community. So I think it's, it's a nice way to stay in touch with data science people. So, um, I guess my title was fair, uh, my the title of my talk was fairly broad, uh, but I've got a slide here that covers what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, I mentioned I'm going to talk a bit about metadata and management of clinical healthcare data. Uh, so to begin with, I want to um, tell you all what uh, what I mean when I say metadata tell you about how uh, it applies to the clinical healthcare setting in the UK, um, where the company I work for is based, and about the goal of data standardization. And within this space, um, really the main part of my talk is about uh, two projects that I've completed in the last six months. So um, one of them has been around mapping pathology codes, and another one has been around suggest suggesting standard data structures. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a bit more about those. And both projects use text matching algorithms, which promote standardization in um, different contexts. So uh, the, it's, they're quite similar algorithms, but two different spaces in which I'm looking at them. Okay, so to begin with, metadata and how it works in the clinical and healthcare context. So, when uh, in the organization I work with, we're primarily helping um, other organizations to better manage their metadata. And mostly these are public service organizations. So they're large, complex organizations and their data is quite, quite varied. So many organizations just wanna start simple. Uh, you'll find that these uh, organizations often don't have a good view of their data in a central place. So I'm sure you've heard before that metadata is data about data. And if you can centralize this into a data catalog, then that really under helps organizations understand what data they've got and what condition it's in. Uh, so how we usually do this is we'll go to an organization and we'll start collecting things like just the names and descriptions of data sets and pull them into a catalog. And then over time, we'll build this up to be um, to uh, include more information about like access protocols or management or um, data dictionaries until the organization really has a good view of what data they own and the sorts of things they should be doing to manage it. However, in the last year, we've worked a lot in the healthcare space in the UK. And this, uh, in, in this field, the metadata management is actually a lot more mature than that simple catalog space. So here, the organizations are really looking to, um, to, towards standardization. And two areas where they're looking to standardize their metadata are around uh, terminology and coding of metadata. So an example I've put here in the UK is uh, DMND, which is a standardized dictionary of all the medicines and all the medical devices in use in uh, the UK, which is used by a whole range of healthcare data sets to ensure that this information is presented in a really standardized manner. 
and then after this, there are some standard data structures. So OMOP is an international standard for presenting uh, patient data in a format that's really useful for research and for consolidating data sets together. So these are kind of the ideas that we're playing with when we think about uh, metadata management. So when we standardize data, we, we ensure that data is um, pre presented in a consistent format and that it's communicated in a consistent way. And this offers a number of benefits. So uh, it can help with collaboration. It means that uh, universities and research institutions and governments can share all sorts of evidence and knowledge confidently across uh, different organizations. And you can combine a lot of different data sets together to really enable large scale data analysis. And of course, if you present data in a consistent manner, then you can make comparisons. Uh, you can build clinical decision support systems so that you can see how a patient's condition has changed over time. You can set up automated surveillance systems so you can monitor adverse reactions to medicines in a public healthcare system. And you can look at um, how the quality and cost of healthcare may change across the country. And then we have this, this goal of data reuse. So uh, a really uh, great dream would be that we could have a, a single collection point for clinical data for, that could be used for clinical purposes. And the same data could be fed into public health management systems and perhaps aggregated and de-anonymized and then eventually used for research. So these are some of the things that um, people working in the healthcare metadata space are, are really excited about. But as a data scientist in this space, I'm interested in thinking about how data analytics and machine learning might be able to be used to enhance uh, some of the management that we do around this. So with, uh, within my organization, which is quite small, we've been thinking about how to kind of bring these tools and techniques into this space. So we've thought a lot about perhaps when we uh, bring on new data sets into our catalog, how could we think about assessing the level to which data is standardized? So could we see how many data elements within a data set um, match and industry or an organizational data standard? Could we perhaps identify some areas for improvement? And ideally, one day we'd really like to build a tool where we can help users onload board their new data set and suggest to them um, appropriate links or relationships to organizational or industry standards, or perhaps transformations that could improve their data standardizations um, to meet the uh, standards that have been set in their organization or industry. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start talking about a couple of the projects I've worked on in this space. Uh, and you can start to see how these techniques might be useful to achieve some of those goals I've talked about in the first part of the session. So the first project I'm gonna talk about is one I did where I was involved in mapping some pathology codes. And I did this using a simple TF-IDF cosine similarity method for text matching. So first I wanna give you a bit of context for this project. Uh, the organization I work for was involved in a feasibility study to look at the transition between read and SNOMED pathology codes. So in terms of standardized coding, pathology was actually uh, a, a quite advanced in this area. So if you think about it, the pathology lab often sits a bit separate from the ward in a hospital, and it deals both with people in the hospital and GPs outside the hospital. So from quite early on, uh, pathology wanted standardized ways to communicate results in an understandable manner between lots of different parties. So they've been using coding systems for a long, long time. In the UK, the UK have used the Read coding system since 1985. It was discontinued in 2018. So there's currently a planning process undergoing to move to a, the new standard, which will be called SNOMED. So 
As part of the feasibility for this process, uh, my organization was involved in creating a repeatable process to create some code mappings. So it was recognized that a code mapping was a useful tool for this transition process, but it was also understood that this couldn't be something that was a once off. The coding standards change over time, new things get added, mistakes get corrected, and uh, so this was there was going to be a need for many mappings to be made over time. Additionally, because these read codes had become quite outdated, we had a situation where local uh, GPs and hospitals and pathology labs had set up their own local coding systems to fill in some of the gaps of the read system, which meant there was going to have to be further exercises to map all the local codes in all the local areas in the UK. So they really wanted to agree on one repeatable process that could be used uh, um, many times over to create these mapping tables. So for this repeatable process, we proposed the following. We suggested we create a list of potential mappings that was informed both by some existing but quite sparse work that had been done on the mappings already and use an algorithm to generate some more suggestions. Once we had all of this, a list of potential mappings that could occur between these codes, we wanted to get pathologists to review and approve these mappings via a web application, which also had a search functionality and maintained an audit trail. Um, so previously to do these sorts of things, people would just use Excel spreadsheets, but we thought it was quite important to be able to see who approved what, at what time, with what comments, and to be able to uh, compare this across a number of pathologists so you could represent some sort of agreement on how this mapping code worked. So I mentioned that we suggested using some algorithms. The algorithm approach I took is from a blog called uh, Fuzzy Matching at Scale. And I've put a link at the, uh, at the end of the presentation for this. And it was very simple and very fast. And as I'll explain throughout the presentation, quite effective for this task. So essentially, I took um, all the labels associated with the read codes and the SNOMED codes. I took the descriptions and the synonyms and I created one big large corpus of all these terms. I removed the punctuation and I made everything lowercase. So then for each of these uh, text elements in the corpus, I turned them into words and bigrams and trigrams um, and then transformed the whole corpus into TFIDF vectors. And I compared everything in the corpus to everything else on one large big cosine similarity matrix. After this, it was just a process of extracting the most relevant uh, matches. So I decided with the client based on just a kind of finger in the air exercise that we would take the top seven matches. We decided that we had a minimum threshold of 0 0.5 for cosine similarity. And um, because I compared everything to everything else, I needed to make sure that the match was actually uh, contained one code from the old system and one code from the new system. So I threw out the others that didn't, that didn't meet that criteria. So there was two ways I evaluated this approach. The first I mentioned earlier, we had a web application. So we loaded all these codes in for pathologists to review. There was about 20 pathologists uh, who all put in uh, a few hours each going through recording comments. There was a search field where if they didn't like what the algorithm suggested, they could search for their own codes. They could approve uh, matches and all of this had, a, had uh, extensive audit logs attached to it. So we could, we could track what was happening throughout the process. And secondly, because it was a feasibility study, we did quite an extensive stakeholder engagement. We spoke to GPs, pathologists, uh, hospital staff, the Department of Health in the UK and some patients. And we presented our proposal of um, what we were doing, what we saw the risks and benefits were. We spoke to them and got their feedback on this. Um, and we agreed a process to maintain these mappings and created a process for should there be any concern in the future, because 
we're talking thousands of codes and humans involved. Um, if there are any mistakes, then how these would be reported and corrected in the future. Um, so there was that dual approach. So when we sent this out to uh, pathologists, the algorithm ended up generating uh, 7,011 candidate matches and it had a, covered about 84.9% of the codes in these coding systems. We actually knew it was never going to cover 100%. The uh, new coding system included codes that we knew didn't exist in the old system. And, uh, the, and also the new system hadn't yet been um, completely finalised. So part of the exercise was also identifying what codes in the old system weren't represented in the new system. So um, that explains the not 100% coverage there. Because it was a feasibility study, we just did a first pass mapping where we showed um, every proposed match we showed to just one pathologist. Uh, as part of the uh, stakeholder agreement and the proposal, we agreed that to actually approve a mapping, you'd have to demonstrate a consensus within the audit log. But this was just a feasibility to try out um, the suggestions and get some feedback from everyone involved. So as part of the first pass mapping, we had 1,421 matches approved. And when I went back and looked at these matches to see uh, where they'd come from, 96.5% of these matches were identified by the algorithm within those first top seven. Uh, as it happened, a number of pathologists uh, used the search bar fairly frequently, um, but most of the time they were adding things that had already appeared to them as suggestions, but um, it demonstrated a bit of human psychology that people like to kind of check for themselves and it will probably play into any future designs um, that we use because also pathologists explained that they really liked the search function as well, that they, that they thought the algorithm suggestions were good, but they always just wanted to kind of check for themselves that there was nothing else they wanted to think about. So um, in this project, we've uh, finalised this report. It's a publicly available report, and if you're interested, uh, there's a link to it at the, on the final slide. And um, it's fed back into the next steps for the pathology transition, so with some considerations for how we move forward. Uh, the client was really happy with the um, simplicity and the effectiveness of the text matching algorithm. And they're talking to us now about using it on some other projects. Um, so for example, there is a UK version of the SNOMED coding system and an international version of the SNOMED coding system. Both of them are uh, like tens of thousands of codes and they're interested to see if this text algorithm could be used to support a consolidation um, exercise between these codes. Uh, and throughout the whole process I was really honest with all the stakeholders that this was very simple text messaging would only consider similarity between the characters on, on the, that made up the text and wouldn't consider any semantic matching. So uh, our clients have also challenged us to see how we could perhaps consider that in the future. So that's the first project that I wanted to talk to you about. And the second project, um, quite similar uh, data science techniques, but in a different area, suggesting data structure standards. Um, and also looking at some uh, pre-trained word embeddings. So we finished the pathology project and we were quite happy with the results. And we were really keen to see if we could use these algorithms to solve some of the problems that I was talking about in the beginning of the talk around how you could perhaps suggest matches between a data set that you've ingested into a data catalog and other data standards. Uh, so we applied and, and got a small Innovate UK grant to try uh, out a little prototype. And what we planned to deliver was um, a application that would profile a data set and where possible, attempt to suggest matches to a data standard. 
Uh, and following on from the previous challenge, we were also interested in investigating some semantic matching techniques and seeing how they performed against this simple text matching algorithm that we'd used on the previous project. So this was our approach. Uh, we created a script that used Pandas Profiler. So the reason for this is that um, many of the organizations we're working with, their data, as you can imagine, in healthcare is extremely sensitive. And in fact, um, we're working with the metadata of it. We're never really coming into contact with the, the actual data itself. So we decided for this first uh, it to create a what will be a open and available script on our organization's GitHub page where um, somebody can download this script and run it inside of a trusted research environment and extract only the profile of a data set. So this would be um, the kind of data element uh, names and the titles and some um, fairly high level um, information about the distributions of the variables inside. Uh, so the idea is that organizations can run this and give us only the data set profile, not the data itself. So following this, we have built a Flask web application that ingests this JSON file and it uh, does the following. So uh, I mentioned that we'd like to try and match it to standards. We chose two to begin with. Uh, the first one is a data dictionary from the National Health Service here in the UK. They have a standardized data dictionary that they use for their gold standard data sets. And um, the other one we tried was the OMOP common data model, which I mentioned earlier, an international standard for patient records. And we tried to match these data elements to these data standards using two methods. So we tried the simple text matching algorithm from the pathology project using TFIDF vectors and cosine similarities. And we tried a pre-trained word embedding uh, algorithm called BioWordVec uh, to extract uh, these vectors and also used cosine similarity to compare them. So let me tell you a bit about BioWordVec. Uh, it's from a paper that came out in 2019 written by Zhang et al. So it's essentially a pre-trained fast text word embedding model uh, Fastex was created by Facebook and it's based on the Skipgram uh, methodology um, algorithm for creating uh, word embeddings. So this particular Fastex model has been trained on two relevant uh, clinical uh, corpuses. So the first one is the PubMed corpus. This is a corpus of um, unstructured data that contains the titles and abstracts of every article that's appeared on PubMed uh, for about three years. And then there's the MIMIC3 data set. This is a partly open data set. You can, uh, you can do a course online and request access to it if you've got a good reason to use it. It's 60,000 uh, patient records for accident and emergency admissions to a hospital in New York. Uh, so quite a famous big data, healthcare data set. Most importantly for this exercise, uh, these word embeddings in the fast text uh, word embedding model will consider uh, semantic similarity. So, for example, you can get a you can get a phrase like heart attack, which has almost no letters um, in common with myocardial infraction, but it does have a very similar meaning. And the the uh, the word embedding vectors that you extract from these models will um, demonstrate that similarity. Essentially, you use this model in much the same way that you'd use the TF-IDF vectors. You do some pre-processing, the model gives you a word embedding vector, and you can measure similarities between other words using a cosine similarity matrix. Evaluating this approach was incredibly challenging. I 
there's not, I'm not, uh, I'd be very surprised if there's any test or train data that's ready made for this problem. So we kind of had to uh, take the approach of trying a range of random data sets and reviewing the results and um, trying to learn a bit about uh, what might work and what doesn't work from this approach. So to begin with, I've done an initial evaluation of uh, these um, methods. I've taken seven very random open healthcare data sets from the internet, which represent 166 data element variables. And I've compared these uh, against both of the standards using both of the methods and manually reviewed the results to try and understand what works and what doesn't. This won't be the only uh, evaluation I do on this. For the final three months of the project, I'll be partnering up with some of the healthcare partners uh, that we work with uh, in my organization. And they have a number of data sets that they are keen to move forward on this standardization process with. So I'll be essentially doing the same thing, but with um, experts who know more about the data than I do about these random data sets I got on the internet. We'll put them through and then we'll also review the results and talk about whether this model actually provides anything of value for, the, for this particular challenge. But to tell you some of the findings from my initial evaluation with the, the random data sets. Uh, so the 166 data elements that I got from these data sets returned 100, uh, 1,900 and 44 predictions. So this was from the uh, kind of four combinations of methods, taking the top three predictions for each data element. So um, based on my manual assessment of all of these predictions, um, I've estimated that about 52% of them seemed like useful suggestions to me, um, looking at, at kind of the, the name of the previous data element and what the machine had associated, the, the algorithm had associated with it in the data standard. Uh, some data sets worked better than others. I had one data set that came through with 85% of the data elements. Um, produced acceptable suggestions, and I had another one that kind of only 12 did. The sorts of things that this did well on um, were patient details. So where there was fields in these data sets that talked about age or gender or address or BMI or smoking, all these sorts of things um, appeared again and again in the, in the example data sets. And the standards were really useful in, in um, linking these to those fields, um, providing greater detail about how to quantify these things. And I think th for these sorts of details, this approach works well. It also approach works really well for date and time fields. So you'll often get uh, the date of diagnosis or the time of admission, uh, these things are also easily to easy to match up using these methods to standards. And there's some administrative uh, details. So you've got provider IDs or hospital locations. Again, this all worked well using these approaches. The challenges. Out of the 166 data elements, about 47 of the data elements had really undescriptive data names. So they were essentially just coding. They said things like AST1 or AFESP. These make no sense to me and they made no sense to the algorithm and they didn't have any predictive value. So they didn't really work out. The other thing that was a bit of a surprise uh, was that made sense <laughs> was symptoms and conditions. So for example, I took some machine learning data sets from Kaggle where you'd have um, kind of a column saying diabetes, yes, no, high blood pressure, yes, no. If you try and transfer, translate these into the two general data, data standards that I was looking at, you require a different sort of transformation. So those data standards are more likely to have things like um, condition description and diabetes would appear within that, um, within that as, a, as a value rather than a data element itself. So it demonstrated that, um, you know, it's, uh, 
the data structures themselves perhaps need to be defined through uh, some pre-processing steps rather than just a simple um, a data element match. It was something where this didn't work well. So um, when I compared the two methods, TFIDF and BioWordVec, each of these methods returned different suggestions, but both of them returned a similar number of useful suggestions. There wasn't one that exceeded the other by any measure. And when I looked at the standards, actually the data dictionary from the uh, National Health Service um, returned about three times more useful suggestions than the OMOP data standard. And I think that reflects the fact that the uh, National Health Service data dictionary is a lot more prescriptive than OMOP, which um, is more generic in the sorts of data standards that it is trying to capture. So based on this initial evaluation, I've noted some improvements. I need to incorporate more detail about each data element into the matching process. So I need to be uh, predicting based on descriptions, data values, data types, and this will really help support with those kind of uh, undescriptive data elements that I saw in the first evaluation. I think there's a strong justification to use both the text matching algorithm and the semantic similarity matching algorithm together because they, uh, as I mentioned, there wasn't one that outperformed the other. And in discussing this with, a, with some partner organizations a couple of weeks ago, uh, someone gave me the suggestion that I may be able to do some pre-processing that could help me better um, deal with that problem I mentioned around symptoms and conditions and matching them to uh, the data standard by using a named entity recognition algorithm, which could identify where a data element contains something like diabetes or high blood pressure as a particular symptom um, so that I could uh, pre-process them or classify them more appropriately within the uh, tool that we're building. So from here, next steps. I mentioned um, I've got three months where I'm looking through this with some partner organizations to get some better information about how this really works with some real world data. Um, I've got a few options to improve the predictiveness of the model, and I've got some options to look at improving the pre-processing. So they're the two projects that I wanted to, meet to that I wanted to talk to you about today, and I'm I'm kind of at the the end of my talk. Um, in the beginning of the talk, we I was speaking about. Um, this question around how data analytics and machine learning could feed into metadata management. And I hope that I've given you uh, two really basic examples of, of how we've started to think about this in healthcare metadata. And obviously you can see that there's a lot more work to really make those um, algorithms fit the complexity of the uh, the, the sort of tool we're trying to build. But um, hopefully it's a, for me, at least, it's been a little insight into how some of this could start to be done. And here's the references I mentioned. Um, the TFIDF similarity matching that I took from a blog um, is at this website. It's a really simple, really uh, useful algorithm that the blog has an excellent explanation of it. If you ever need something quick and snappy to do something like this, I really recommend you um, give it a go. Uh, I mentioned the pathology project I was working on. The feasibility report is available publicly at um, the project partners I worked with, the professional records and standards body here in the UK. And the BioWordVec paper um, that was from Zhang et al. Papers available on Nature and the pre-trained models uh, are ready for download if you've got a fairly large AWS system to run their hefty files, um, you can have a go at those as well.